Now, we're going to show you the scene in Washington right now because um, coming up in the next few minutes, quite important developments. We are expecting the spe special counsel, Robert Mueller, uh, to make a statement on his investigation into allegations of Russian interference into the U.S. elections in 2016. Now, Robert Mueller will not be taking any questions. Uh, we're expecting a short statement, just a few minutes long, but we will we'll bring you that uh, when it comes into us. Um, you'll remember that President Trump said that uh, Robert Mueller's two-year investigation had exonerated him uh, after Mr. Trump had re repeatedly denounced it as a witch hunt. Um, the investigation involved dozens of people um, looking at them, examining, investigating them, including several top Trump advisers and a series of Russian nationals and Russian companies as well. So um, US Special Counsel Robert Mueller making his first public comments on his investigation uh, into alleged Russian interference, Russian meddling really, in the uh, presidential election that Donald Trump won, that Hillary Clinton lost. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say, because he hasn't said anything at all. On it, although of course Donald Trump did say that it was uh, all a complete exoneration of him. Um, so we'll bring you that when it begins in the next few minutes, live in Washington. Hello, you're watching Afternoon Live. I'm Ben Brown today at four. Live pictures now from Washington. U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller about to speak publicly. Doug, good about morning, his investigation into the American presidential election. Here. Two years ago, the acting attorney general asked me to serve as special counsel, and he created the special counsel's office. The appointment order directed the office to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. This included investigating any links or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Now, I have not spoken publicly during our investigation. I'm speaking out today because our investigation is complete. The Attorney General has made the report on our investigation largely public. We are formally closing the Special Counsel's Office, and as well, I'm resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private life. I'll make a few remarks about the results of our work, but beyond these few remarks, it is important that the office's written work speak for itself. Let me begin where the appointment order begins, and that is interference in the 2016 presidential election. As alleged by the grand jury in an indictment, Russian intelligence officers who were part of the Russian military launched a concerted attack on our political system. The indictment alleges that they used sophisticated cyber techniques to hack into computers and networks used by the Clinton campaign. They stole private information and then released that information through fake online and identities and through the organization WikiLeaks. The releases were designed and timed to interfere with our election and to damage a presidential candidate. And at the same time as the grand jury alleged in a separate indictment, a private Russian entity engaged in a social media operation where Russian citizens posed as Americans in order to influence an, an election. These indictments contain alleg allegations, and we are not co commenting on the guilt or the innocence of any specific defendant. Every defendant is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. The indictments allege, and the other activities in our report describe, efforts to interfere in our political system. They needed to be investigated and understood, and that is among the reasons why the Department of Justice established our office. That is also a reason we investigated efforts to obstruct the investigation. The matters we investigated were of paramount importance. It was critical for us to obtain full and accurate information from every person we questioned. 
When a subject of an investigation obstructs that investigation or lies to investigators, it strikes at the core of the government's effort to find the truth and hold wrongdoers accountable. Let me say a word about the report. The report has two parts, addressing the two main issues we were asked to investigate. The first volume of the report details numerous efforts emanating from Russia to influence the election. This volume includes a discussion of the Trump campaign's response to this activity, as well as our conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. And in the second volume, the report describes the results and analysis of our obstruction of justice investigation involving the president. The order appointing me special counsel authorized us to investigate actions that could obstruct the investigation. And we conducted that investigation and we kept the office of the acting attorney general apprised of the progress of our work. And as set forth in the report after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. It explains that under long-standing department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. The department's written opinion explaining the policy makes several important points that further informed our handling of the obstruction investigation. Those points are summarized in our report, and I will describe two of them for you. First, the opinion explicitly permits the investigation of a sitting president because it is important to preserve evidence while memories are fresh and documents available. Among other things, that evidence could be used if there were co-conspirators who could be charged now. And second, the opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. And beyond department policy, we were guided by principles of fairness. It would be unfair to potentially it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime when there can be no court resolution of the actual charge. So that was Justice Department policy. Those were the principles under which we operated. And from them, we concluded that we would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. That is the office's, that is the office's final position and we will not comment on any other conclusions or hypotheticals about the president. We conducted an independent criminal investigation and reported the results to the Attorney General, as required by Department regulations. The Attorney General then concluded that it was appropriate to provide our report to Congress and to the American people. At one point in time, I requested that certain portions of the report be released the Attorney General preferred to, make that in, preferred to make the entire report public all at once, and we appreciate that the Attorney General made the report largely public, and I certainly do not question the Attorney General's good faith in that decision. Now, I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress. Any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. 
and the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. In addition, access to our underlying work product is being decided in a process that does, that does not involve our office. So beyond what I have said here today and what is contained in our written work, I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. Now before I step away, I want to thank the attorneys, the FBI agents, the analysts, the professional staff who helped us conduct this investigation in a fair and independent manner. These individuals who spent nearly two years with the special counsel's office were of the highest integrity. And I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments that there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. So that's uh, U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller there making his first public comments on his investigation into allegations of Russian interference in the uh, 2016 U.S. presidential election. Um, really not adding, frankly, to his uh, report, which was um, published some time ago, that report, uh, which Donald Trump said was an exoneration of the uh, allegations against him of uh, taking part in a criminal conspiracy with Moscow to win uh, the White House. Robert Mueller there just saying that charging the president with a crime was not an option. Uh, the special counsel's office could consider under guidelines from the uh, Justice uh, Department. He said he is formally closing the special counsel's office now, effectively that his work is done. He himself is resigning from the Justice uh, Department. Um, so that was Robert Mueller. He was saying really that it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime, namely the president, when there could be no court resolution of uh, those allegations or that charge. Um, so that's the latest from Robert Mueller there. Special counsel Robert Mueller just making his first public comments, but not really enlarging very much uh, on his uh, long reports into uh, Russian interference into the 2016 presidential campaign. We'll be talking to our Washington correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, uh, with uh, his take on that statement from Robert Mueller in the next few minutes. Thank you, Damien. Now, let's take you back to that statement we've had in the last few minutes from the US Special Counsel, Robert Mueller. Um, he's been talking about his investigation into alleged uh, Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election. And we can speak to our Washington correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue. Gary, um, it was the first time he's spoken about his investigation and his report, but of course we had his very long report. Did we learn anything new from what he had to say a few minutes ago? Well, you're right, Ben, this is a sort of watershed moment. This man had been completely stum for the last two years, not saying a word publicly. And now, when the work is over, he came out and essentially reiterated uh, his conclusions, namely that there was no collusion that they could find between the Trump campaign and Russia, although there was significant efforts uh, by the Russians to interfere with the political process uh, for the benefit of one candidate and that candidate being Donald Trump. But on the second part of his investigation, the obstruction of justice, again, he said in the original report that he couldn't come to a conclusion. And he made a very specific point today of, of setting that out again. And let me just read you what he said. He said, if we had had confidence that the pre president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. So if they could, be, if could have been sure that the president didn't obstruct justice, they would have said so. He then went on to set out some of the Department of Justice rules and some of the presidents, which said charging the president with a crime was not an option we could consider. So I think he's trying to, in a sense, reiterate and to reinforce that second part, that second part of the investigation, which is the one, of course, that Democrats are most interested in, uh, given what Donald Trump has said of, about himself being totally exonerated on all counts. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because as you say, Donald Trump claims he's been absolutely exonerated, but then 
that's less than wholehearted, isn't it, when, when Robert Mueller says, if we had confidence the president did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Right? It's a bit like a double negative. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, it's a bit round the houses, but what it's saying is, we're not sure whether he did or not, but if we're sure he didn't, we would have said so. Uh, the other thing, of course, and, and it, it, we've heard this, is the, the difficulty of legal precedents and whether or not you can charge a sitting president. Uh, that seems to be something the Department of Justice doesn't think you can do. There are arguments about that. And bear in mind, one of the other things that Robert Mueller said in this statement is that, look, I've got nothing more to add than is in my report. And this is reflecting the ongoing battle, if you like, between the Department of Justice, the Special Counsel's Office, and Democrats in Congress who want him to come and appear before their committees, to be questioned in public or in private or a bit of both. Those negotiations have been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and they've got nowhere, really. Uh, he hasn't had a subpoena issued against him yet, but that's still a possibility mm -hmm. that's on the table. But he's saying here, look, even if I do end up there, then I've got no more to say, and I will add no more than I've said in the report. He also uh, made it clear, uh, Ben, today that uh, not only was his office winding up, but he was resigning from the Department of Justice and heading back to private life. Uh, yeah. Not entirely surprising given the two years he's had. Yeah, heading off for a quiet life. Um, uh, from <laughs> Donald Trump's point of view, is this sort of effectively all over? Has he, has he ridden out the storm? Yeah, look, there are no bombshells in this. I mean, you know, this had the potential when you see, you know, Robert Mueller's about to do a statement at the Department of Justice and he said nothing for the last two years in public. You think, oh my goodness me, what be going? But we're told that the White House was informed last night about it. Uh, I think if they were worried about the content, uh, then you'd have seen some, um, some, uh, some, some early kind of... Uh, uh, defence getting in there uh, before he even stood up, but they clearly weren't. Uh, and I think they will say that this simply underlines what they've been saying all along. Democrats, of course, will say, well, there's still this open question about obstruction of justice. We need to know more. We need to see the underlying evidence. But to, to, I think that the, the, the White House will certainly feel that um, they're out of the woods on this. Uh, and bear in mind that the bottom line when it comes to uh, the election and things like that next year is that, and we saw this in the midterms, voters don't really care much about the Russia thing. All right, Gary, thank you so much. That's Gary O'Donoghue there, our Washington correspondent. The statement delivered by Robert Mueller, the uh, special counsel uh, at the Department of Justice in Washington within the past hour. Well, President Trump wasted no time in taking to social media in responding to that, reaffirming his view on the outcome of the Mueller investigation. This is what he said. Nothing changes from the Mueller report. There was insufficient evidence and therefore in our country a person is innocent. The case is closed! Exclamation mark. Thank you. That was the response from President Trump. Let's go live to Washington and talk to our correspondent there, Gary O'Donoghue. Gary, first of all, can we be in any doubt at all about what Mr Mueller was basically underlining in this uh, statement? I don't think so. I think this is essentially reiterating what we learned from his report, but making it very clear that his hands were tied. He had no ability to indict the president, even if there was these 10 or so instances uh, of evidence of obstruction of justice. And as you pointed out, he'd said very explicitly in his statement that if they'd been able to say that the president wasn't guilty, they would have done so. But they weren't able to say that, but they couldn't charge him anyway. He's handing the baton here, Hugh, on to Congress. He's effectively saying, it's up to you guys if you want to do anything more about this. And we've already had some reaction from the Democrats, uh, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler, who's been trying to get Robert Mueller to testify in front of him. And he says, it falls to Congress to respond to the crimes, lies and other wrongdoings of President Trump and we will do so. No one, not even the President of the United States, is above the law, says Mr Nadler. So that may be a nod towards impeachment in the future, it may be a nod towards further investigation by his committee, but you can, you can be sure from this, I think, that the Democrats are not going to let this go, uh, whereas the White House thinks this draws a real thick black line under the whole matter. What's the state of public opinion on this, Gary, in the sense that uh, Congress has clearly made rather different noises about the possibility of taking this forward, especially on the Democratic side? Um, how would you characterise it? 
Well, let's be clear. The, 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 Russia, the voters don't really care about Russia. Uh, they didn't really care in the midterms. There's no sign that it's going to be a major issue for them uh, in the election next year, the general election. And that's why, of course, there is this sort of debate inside the Democratic Party. Uh, you've got the new, young, more left-wing members of Congress who want to go after the president. You've got the older guard, the leadership, who believe there is nothing to be gained and substantial amounts potentially to be lost if they're seen to be vindictive or pursuing something that has already been thrown out in many ways by a two-year investigation. So that's the problem that the opposition faces here at the moment. What to do next, how to do it, and whether or not the voters will care even if they do do it. Gary, good to talk to you again. Thank you very much. Gary O'Donoghue there with his thoughts on the, the Mueller statement today. Well, let's get more on this. Let's speak to Eric Bolling. He's a former Fox News anchor who now hosts America This Week and is a friend of Donald Trump. And thank you so much for being here on the program. Uh, so what did you make? We had eight minutes there from Robert Mueller. What did you make of the content? Well, it's amazing that two years can be summarized in eight minutes. Of course, everyone who listened to it is going to make their own judgments. They're going to hear what they want to hear. Here's what I did here, though. I, I heard uh, Robert Mueller put a, put a bow tie on the two-year investigation saying this is it. This is all we're going to talk about. Let's move on. Of course, the left in the country will say, well, if we had more confidence uh, that, uh, that he was innocent, we would have said that. In America, though, our laws state this specifically. You're innocent until proven guilty. That word guilty is, is, is extremely important. Not once did Mueller say, Trump was guilty of anything. Therefore, it, under our legal system, Trump is innocent of all charges. They could not find a guilty, um, a, a guilty plea to hang on Trump. So therefore, he he's he's done. He's finished, he as far as I'm concerned. Robert Mueller, though, did talk in detail about the constraints uh, in terms of the rules that surround a president. Did you not think it was significant when you heard the special counsel say these words? If there was clear evidence the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. He didn't say so. Right. And therefore, if there's clear evidence that he had committed a crime, they would have charged him with a crime, but they couldn't do that either. So in America, unfortunately for the people who do not like Trump, you are innocent until proven guilty. They could not prove guilty on any of them. And so therefore, can we, can we move on now? Can the United States just move forward towards... Um, looking to a 2020 election and, and to see if Donald Trump, if the American people believe Donald Trump is guilty of a crime or not? It's interesting that's where you would want to move on to because he said at both ends, he bookended uh, what he said by talking about Russian interference in your presidential election. And he finished by saying it is absolutely clear there was multiple systemic efforts to interfere with our elections that deserve the attention of every American. If you don't want to look at those particular uh, uh, allegations around Donald Trump, isn't that where you should be looking? The ah, Russian interference... Well, Russian... Hang on a second. Let me finish the words. question. You ch okay, Let me finish sure. the question. Shouldn't this administration be looking at Russian interference and how to protect future U.S. elections? Because we heard very little from Donald Trump on exactly that. Okay. Well, I agree with you, but you changed the words. You said uh, that there was clear uh, evidence that the Russians were trying to influence our election and likely did influence our election. Um, but you, did, you added that Trump was involved in that. He was not involved no, in that. I didn't say that. Nor I didn't did say that. Nor did Mueller. Yes, I didn't say did. that. No, you did. I didn't say you that. I said, I said you that did. Mueller's conclusions was there was multiple systemic efforts to yes. influence those elections, and that's what yes. the attention of every American should be on. I added that in the past, Donald Trump hasn't really focused on Russian interference, and perhaps no, that is that where later, he needs to focus. That's fine. Fair. I agree with you. But let me, let me, let's get this straight. Russians have interfered with our elections and likely most elections around the globe for the better part of, you know, five decades or longer even. And guess what? When Donald Trump is no longer president, whether it's in 2020 or 2024, and let's just say uh, Michelle Obama is the next president, um, the Russians will try and influence that election as well. They will always try and influence our elections. They've always done it and they always will going forward. All right. Eric Bolling, thanks very much for taking time to speak to us. Thank you. You're welcome. The U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller speaks about his investigation into Russian interference for the first time. In the past hour, he said that constitutional rules meant charging President Trump for a federal crime was never an option.
If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. And Donald Trump has just tweeted, nothing changes. The case, he said, is now closed. Robert Mueller says uh, this is his only statement on the investigation. Has it changed anything and how will Congress react? This is Global. Welcome back to the program and let's return to that breaking news out of Washington because within the last hour the special counsel Robert Mueller has been giving his first and possibly last public statement on his investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. He completed his report earlier this year and it's been subsequently described by President Trump as a complete exoneration. But Robert Mueller, who spent nearly two years on the report, has been rather more nuanced. He pointed out today it would have been unconstitutional to charge the president with a federal crime. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. It explains that under long-standing department policy, a president, president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. Well, the special counsel also made it clear that he intended for this statement, alongside the report, to be his last word on the investigation. Now, I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress. Any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. Well, in the last half an hour, President Trump has tweeted. He said, nothing changes from the Mueller report. There was insufficient evidence, and therefore, in our country, a person is innocent. The case is closed, exclamation mark. Thank you. However, the Democrats have said that since Mueller was unable to pursue criminal charges, it falls to Congress to respond to the wrongdoing of President Trump. The former executive editor of the New York Times and author Jill Abramson gave us her assessment of Robert Mueller's statement. Well, what I made of it is that Mueller, you know, in several references just to the Congress, uh, is making the point that he was bound by the Justice Department rules. You can't indict, you know, a sitting president. But the one word that was never spoken was impeachment. And, you know, many legal scholars have said, you know, that this now, you know, should be decided if there's going to be a trial. It should be an impeachment trial in the Senate if the House decides to you know, vote for impeachment. And, you know, that's a process out of Mueller's hands. And I suspect he is happy to have it out of his hands. And the other thing I thought was very important, as he said, this is the only moment that he intends to speak publicly about this. And he, you know, has said no one has told him whether to testify. But the first statement would suggest that he, you know, if it's his decision, he won't. And in terms of that key passage that Gary latched on to, and I'll read it out again, where Robert Mueller said, if there was clear evidence the president did not uh, commit a crime, we would have said so. Uh, what did you make of right. that? Uh, and well, do you think, think this I still think goes back to lawmakers in terms of where they go with pursuing it? I, I do, but I, I, the way I interpreted that statement is he is probably anticipating that the president will again say 
Mueller exonerated him. And I interpret that statement as saying if we'd found that he was innocent of obstruction, we would have said so and dot, dot, dot. And we didn't. So, you know, I'm not of course, the president and his supporters will have a completely different uh, interpretation of the statement, but I actually think it was clear as crystal. Just a final thought, because th these are always difficult questions to ask, I know, but where do you think the American public are with all of this? So quite clearly from uh, what you were just saying, you know, the lawmakers will have to look at this, decide how they want to pursue it, but what do you think the majority of the American public want to see going forward? Have they had enough of this, or do they want some of those questions answered? I think at this point they're largely disengaged with, you know, the Mueller probe and, you know, the obstruction case, the, the Russia angle. I mean, none of the members of Congress, when they go home, say they're being asked about it at all by their constituents. I mean, the American people seem to be concerned with the economy and health care and education and, you know, substantial issues that affect their lives. And I think for the most part, as I said, the American public is now disengaged. The base of both parties, you know, the, the left and the right are still, you know, very engaged with this issue. But, you know, most Americans are not in that category. Well, that was Joe Abramson. Well, Erin Branco is a national security reporter at the Daily Beast. She joins me live now from Washington. Uh, welcome here to the program. So what did you make of what Robert Mueller had to say? Well, I think it was incredibly shocking, um, you know, news to wake up to. I think all the reporters in D.C., uh, you know, were not aware that this was coming. It was, uh, you know, a huge deal when we woke up, uh, scrambling to figure out what was going on here. But I think in terms of what Mueller said, I don't think he said anything, um, you know, particularly shocking in and of itself. I think that the appearance uh, was a big deal, but I think the words that he said sort of ring true to what we've been hearing out of the Department of Justice for some time. Um, and morning, I think he just everyone, hit the point home you that, you know, reiterated the point in the report that said, you know, we did not, uh, you know, go forward with uh, find, trying to find a crime or, you know, charging a crime uh, for the president, but that does not exonerate him. I think he, he sort of brought that point home. And basically what he said is, you know, this is Congress's job now. I'm done. I'm resigning. Uh, you know, and he said, I'd prefer not to testify, but uh, we'll have to wait and see whether or not he'll get called. Is that the critical passage, uh, those words I'm about to read out again, that uh, he said, uh, if there was clear evidence the president did uh, clearly not commit a crime, we would have said so. And he, of course, left it hanging because they didn't say so. Uh, you, you make the assessment that it's now for lawmakers. What do you think they're likely to do? Right. I mean, I think his words today were pretty critical for top Democrats on the Hill. They're sort of reading back through the transcript, trying to piece together what they can use to make their uh, points stronger in terms of the rhetoric, rhetoric we've been hearing on the Hill. You know, we need Mueller to testify. We need him to come in and talk about the report. You know, Mueller said today, I'm not going to say anything different than what I've already said in the report, but I think for House Democrats, the strategy is getting Mueller in a public forum, getting him to testify about the report so that, you know, all Americans can really hear from him about what the report says, because the majority of Americans have not read the Mueller report. Uh, so I think in terms of strategy for the Democrats, getting him in in front of Congress is still something that they're, they're working toward. And, of course, both sides take what they want from Mueller, and we've seen that play out in the last couple of hours uh, since uh, those public statements. But uh, he also made it clear that if he was forced to uh, testify to Congress, he wouldn't go much further than what he said today. But is the critical bit uh, the fact that he said that uh, it's up to lawmakers to access underlying evidence? That's not a decision that the special counsel's office can make. Is that going to be an important error, the underlying evidence that was here at play? So 
So I think the House Judiciary uh, Committee and Chairman Jerry Nadler have said before that they want access to the underlying evidence uh, to sort of go through it, make sure that there's nothing that they're missing. But at the end of the day, I don't think that the underlying evidence to the report is going to give House Democrats or Democrat or top Democrats on the Hill much leverage. I think that ultimately what they really want is for Mueller to testify and that the underlying evidence is sort of second to what their main goal is. And, you know, Attorney General Bill Barr has said, you know, DOJ will not join Nadler or the House Judiciary Committee in going to court to get that underlying evidence. So it would really be up to Nadler uh, deciding for himself whether or not that's something that the committee wanted to go forward and do. Uh, but coming back to the report itself, um, at the end of the day, it's not really Barr that they needed to testify. It's Mueller. And I think that that is still a point that they're trying to take home today. All right, uh, Aaron Banco, thank you so much uh, for talking to us. Uh, and Robert Mueller has spoken publicly for the first time. The U.S. Special Counsel has spent the past two years investigating Russia's interference in the 2016 election campaign, looking into any ties between the Trump administration and Russia, and investigating any possible obstruction of justice by the president. Now, he completed his report in March, and in April we saw a redacted version of it come out. But while all ears here in the BBC Newsroom were tuned to Mr. Mueller's statement today, we didn't learn much that was new. President Trump hasn't changed his mind either. He says there was insufficient evidence and therefore in our country a person is innocent. Case closed. Now his press secretary also spoke to the media. We think the president has been fully and completely exonerated based on the fact there was no collusion, there was no conspiracy and there was no obstruction. Now let's take the big questions one by one. First of all, Russian interference and the Trump campaign's response. The first volume of the report details numerous efforts emanating from Russia to influence the election. This volume includes a discussion of the Trump campaign's response to this activity, as well as our conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. Well, Robert Mueller then said the second part of his report was about whether the president attempted to obstruct his investigation. Here is his finding. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. And for those Democrats and others who want to see the president charged, Mr. Mueller repeated what was in his report. Under long-standing department policy, a pres president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. Let's talk to Anthony Zerka in Washington. Anthony, this statement came as rather a surprise to all of us. Why do you think Robert Mueller felt he needed to say all this now? Well, I think the occasion was that Robert Mueller was announcing that he was uh, stepping aside, shutting down the special counsel investigation after two years. So essentially he was trying in his statement today to close his portion uh, of, uh, of his role in this investigation, handing it over essentially to the politics that are swirling around here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I also think he wanted to send a message to Congress that if they're going to try to call him to testify in person, that he's not going to give them any new information. Uh, he said very clearly that his views and findings are written in the report, and if they want to know what he thinks, they can read the report. Anthony, stay with us. Uh, as you were just saying, uh, Mr. Mueller announced he's resigning from the Justice Department now that it's all over, but it's not over yet. The Democrats want him to appear in front of Congress. He doesn't seem to want that. I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress, 
any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. Well, Gerald Nadler is a senior Democrat in the House of Representatives, and he says the investigations will continue. He didn't rule out impeachment proceedings. It falls to Congress to respond to the crimes, lies, and other wrongdoing of President Trump. We will do so. Make no mistake, no one, not even the President of the United States, is above the law. If Mueller wanted to exonerate the President from having committed a crime, he would have said so. Instead, and he says he would have said so. Instead, the special counsel makes clear that obstruction of justice, which he found substantial evidence of, is a serious crime that strikes at the core of our justice system, and that the Constitution points to Congress to take action to hold the President accountable. Now, Kamala Harris, a Democratic presidential candidate, uh, tweeted what Robert Mueller basically did was return an impeachment referral. Now it's up to Congress to hold this president accountable. Let's go back to Anthony. Does this put the ball in Congress's court, Anthony? I think it very clearly does do that. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, has been attempting to tamp down these impeachment sentiments among the Democratic caucus and the House of Representatives. It's going to be harder for her to do that going forward. Uh, there have been multiple calls now for impeachment proceedings to begin uh, from presidential candidates, including Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren. Even Joe Biden, who is the front runner, former vice president, didn't rule out impeachment. Uh, you heard one Republican congressman just a few days ago call for impeachment hearings, but he is uh, alone at least so far. Uh, but I think, you know, es essentially what you saw. Uh, on the obstruction uh, charges uh, was on one hand, uh, Robert Mueller said there wasn't enough evidence uh, to say, or the evidence indicated you couldn't say Donald Trump didn't commit a crime, but he was prohibited from saying that Donald Trump did commit a crime by Justice Department guidelines. He said the, the forum for accusing the president of a, a crime lies elsewhere, and that elsewhere is Congress, and a lot of Democrats are pointing to that uh, as a hint, essentially, from Robert Mueller that it's their turn to step into this. Anthony, just one thing you tweeted earlier, insufficient evidence isn't exactly the complete exoneration that Donald Trump was claiming after the Attorney General released that uh, four-page report summary back in March. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, you heard Donald Trump uh, say that he was totally exonerated, that there was no uh, collusion, no obstruction. But even in Donald Trump's tweet earlier today, talking about insufficient evidence and how it should be closed, that was a lot, uh, lot softer a response than he gave in those early days. Uh, the reality is that Robert Mueller's uh, report paints a complicated picture, uh, and you're going to see people look at it and on one side claim that it, uh, it should be case closed, move on. But then Democrats on the other side saying this is evidence grounds for impeachment. Uh, it's not going to settle the issue at all. This has always been a political issue. And I think the debate clearly moves into the political forum and Congress in particular. Continue to stay with us, if you will, Anthony. One more thing to touch on. Uh, the last thing we heard from Robert Miller was about Russian interference. And I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments that there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, we heard Robert Mueller there being so categorical about Russian interference in the election in 2016. What does that mean for 2020, looking ahead? Well, I think Robert Mueller was sending a big flashing warning sign to the American public. He ends by talking about how the American public should take notice of this. He opened his statement talking about the Russian attacks on American democracy on the U.S. elections uh, and detailing the, specific, the specifics of it, hacking and social media campaigns. So Robert Mueller wanted, if anything, for the American public to take the point out of this uh, that America was under the attack two years ago uh, and that it could be under attack again. And, and that the American public needs to demand action to try to secure American elections and American democracy from outside influences. Anthony, thanks very much, Anthony Zerka, there in Washington. Robert Mueller 
Well, shortly after that statement from Robert Mueller came President Trump's response on Twitter. He wrote, nothing changes from the Mueller report. There was insufficient evidence and therefore in our country a person is innocent. The case is closed. Thank you. Well, we can speak now to Jacqueline Thompson, who's a reporter for The Hill. She's been following the Mueller report. Jacqueline, I, mean, I know there wasn't anything hugely new in this statement today, but what stood out for you? For me, it personally stood out that Mueller was so clear in not exonerating the president. Um, he really reiterated the message that was in his report already, where he said that we just don't have enough evidence or we're just not going to say whether or not the president committed a crime, um, but we're not going to fully clear his name. And he also seemed to be giving Congress a bit of a green light and saying, maybe I can bring charges against the president, but it's very possible that you could if you wanted the opportunity to do so. So I think that's something that also stood out as well and that a lot of Democrats are seizing on to. And yet the president himself said the case is closed. Um, if the American public are not desperately gripped and electrified by this going on any longer, is it a risk for the Democrats to pursue this in terms of congressional hearings? It definitely is. And there are a lot of progressives within the House of Representatives that are pushing for impeachment proceedings to start moving forward. They're saying that there is evidence of wrongdoing by the president, that um, the attorney general who reviewed the evidence by Mueller and decided not to pursue a charge against President Trump uh, was biased in that decision against doing so, and that there is more than enough evidence to bring forward such a charge. So it's very possible that we will see the Democrats start bringing up a, an impeachment proceeding against President Trump, although the leadership doesn't quite seem to buy onto it quite yet. But in terms of evidence, of new evidence to uh, throw into the story, that's it, we're done. Now that we have the Mueller report, now that M Robert Mueller has spoken, he said this is his testimony. He doesn't need to go before Congress in his own view. Um, there is nothing more to add. Well, I wouldn't say there's nothing more to add. Um, there's always the possibility that House Democrats could subpoena Robert Mueller to appear before their committees. He today announced that he would be resigning from the Department of Justice, which means he no longer has to report to the agency, and they can no longer step in and say, you can't go to Congress and say any further. But it seems pretty clear that he doesn't want to speak out any much more about all of this. On the other hand, the Senate is still conducting its own investigation into the Russian election interference, and that also includes any contacts between the Trump campaign and Russia. So this is definitely not a done deal quite yet. Jacqueline Thompson, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, joining me now is constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley. Jonathan, thank you very much for coming thank in. Thank you. Uh, what do you think Mr. Mueller actually achieved with this statement? I'm not sure, because there's a lot of curious aspects to the statement. On one hand, Mueller was saying that these, this policy that you can't indict a president also meant to him that you couldn't reach conclusions on whether a president committed a crime. And that led a lot of us to scratching our heads, because no one has ever made that argument before. Those memos deal only with the prosecution of a sitting president. They say nothing about reaching conclusions. That's what a special counsel does. So Mueller was saying that he basically redefined his role and that he never intended to reach conclusions on crimes. That was a surprise to everyone. For the last two years, Congress and the Justice Department have ex been expecting conclusions. So why the ambiguity? Do you think he's just kicking the can down the road? Is this actually a referral for impeachment? Well, I think that he is clearly indicating that Congress should take this up. But the legal basis for what he said in the, in the presser was confusing at best. Even if these memos were ambiguous, the Attorney General of the United States and the Deputy Attorney General, his immediate supervisors, told him to reach conclusions, according to Attorney General Barr. The Attorney General makes policy at Department of Justice, so he, wouldn't, so he ignored that. And it, it led a lot of us wondering what's going on here. He reached conclusions on crimes associated with collusion, um, and then he didn't when it came to obstruction. So what can clear this up? Because Mr. Mueller was supposed to be that person. 
Well, now it's in the hands of Congress, but the Democrats are sort of caught in this vortex of their own making. You know, they have pumped up impeachment, but the leadership doesn't want to impeach Donald Trump, and the only thing they want less than impeaching Donald Trump is actually removing Donald Trump. You know, he's good for the Democrats in office. But this is going to put more pressure on Nancy Pelosi. A lot of Democrats are saying, well, what gives? When are you going to start an impeachment inquiry? Is there something that Congress could do that falls short of impeachment but still expresses their displeasure and has some kind of legal weight? Or what about censure? You really, it, censure is really not something the Constitution contemplates. Uh, you either impeach and remove a president or you do not. And uh, the Democrats have control of the House. They probably could impeach this president. He would then have to stand trial in the Senate. Uh, but anything short of that is going to be viewed as a victory by Trump. What they want to do is to investigate every aspect of his life, and they're going to proceed to do that. And Mueller certainly gave them support for doing that. He kept on saying, you know, we couldn't rule out a crime. And it led a lot of us to be like, well, what exactly are you doing? You're saying that you can't reach a conclusion, but you have almost this coquettish way of, you know, doing a wink and a nod that I can't rule it out, you know. And I thought the whole press conference was a little bit odd. And then he refused to take questions. So it's sort of like Moses down from Mount Sinai. Jonathan Turley, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us.